Hello, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of The Practice. This show is an unrehearsed look into my workflow. I'm Stuart. I'm a 3D artist, illustrator, designer, and your pal. And I'm excited to have you back this week. Um, This week's episode is revolving around a feature that I just learned about, but found really, really useful and can't wait to, to try more of. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it gets you some dynamics and it, it uh, allows you to make use of the hair dynamics that are sort of built in and, and um, generated automatically. But you make use of that with actual geometry by rendering instances of this geometry using those hair objects. So, so let's get into it. Basically what you've seen so far is we've taken a plane with a good amount of subdivisions on it. And I've modified the top just because that's how I want my blades of grass to look. Um, so we, we basically start with the object that we're looking to clone across the hairs. And I'm just setting up a little gradient texture on it. And after we've got that, Basically what I do is I take a plane or a, a landscape object, which I'm going to drop in now, make it nice and big, reduce the, the polygon count a little bit, keeping my figures nice and round and even. And I'm basically just going to add hair, right? So we add our hair. And then all we have to do really is go over to generate. We turn off render hairs. We're going to go to instance. And we're going to drag the geometry that we want to be cloned across these hairs into that instance. Now immediately, you see something happened, but you got these little tiny dots and it's not quite what we want, right? So you have to go into the hair material that's automatically generated when you generate those hairs and turn up the thickness to match what you want your, uh, the thickness of your geometry to be, right? And what I did was I just matched the thickness of the actual uh, grass geometry itself. And then I had to, um, then I had to change the orientation a little bit of the, the uh, hairs, the DC, to, to, get them, to get them right. So I hit plus Z, and then we see all of a sudden, boom, that our, hair, uh, our hairs are now actually these blades of grass. That is the geometry that we plugged into the instance. Amazing. And as soon as you hit play, all of that hair and grass will flop over and move and, and uh, be dynamic automatically which really is is one of the key benefits of this technique. The other thing that you'll want to do um, that I did quickly was um, make it so that your guide hairs match your actual rendered hairs. Um, The guide hairs are what you see in your viewer, and the the hairs themselves could be different from that, the way they're they're rendered in the actual output. So you want to click a little box that says... um, like guide, uh, what does it say? Guide hairs, uh, match guide hairs, something like that. Uh, important little trick there, so that what you're seeing in the viewer is what will match the final rendering, right? And then the cool thing that you can do is you can um, you can turn on rigidity, so that instead of being really like noodle-like and floppy like this, the hairs are a little, a little more stiff, a little more rigid. So you can see a lot of what we need to do is in this dynamics tag, right? And that little rigid tab will allow these hairs to uh, stand up straight a little bit more like real hairs would. And I'm adding a um, hair collider to the, to the floor object here. So that way the, um, the grass, when it flops over, doesn't go straight through it. And then you can see how they behave with rigidity turned on. So I'm going to turn up my frame count so we have a little bit more room to animate across. And then you can see movement automatically happens when you move the object the hairs are connected to. So there's a lot of potential for keyframeless animation techniques using that. Um, but we're not. We're going to use um, what's really. What's also really cool is most of the effectors in the simulate dropdown will work on this hair as well. So what we're going to do is 
we're going to set up a little bit of wind in this scene to gently blow across this grass. And we're going to have this kind of grassy hillside scene with um, really easily animated uh, grass sort of flowing in the breeze there. So you see we added a wind object. I had to turn the, um, I had to turn the, the wind speed way up to really affect these things nicely. But boom, in a matter of minutes, we've set up this blowing grass animation that has a, a really convincing, really nice look and has a lot of, of options for us to play with as well. So I also turned up the, the turbidity or the, the turbulence in the wind object so that we get more sort of left and right, up and down movement. It it's, um, creates more variation basically in the movement that's applied uh, to these hairs, which helps a lot. Super uniform look doesn't really, uh, doesn't look very realistic. I'm going for sort of a low contrast look here. I want the the blades of grass to blend with the uh, with the floor plane below them a little bit. So I've got the beginning of the gradient sort of matching the gra the the ground plane, and the top of the gradient sort of being the brightest bit. Also added some randomness to the direction that the hairs were facing in. So they have a little bit of rotation. And I decided to make the tips of the grass a little bit uh, thinner, which you can adjust using the um, sort of that, that slider, that histogram thing inside the uh, hair material. And that's pretty much it. We've got our dynamics set up, and now I'm going to spend the rest of the, the video really just creating this scene. So we've got, we've got our animation in the foreground, kind of how we want it. And so what I'm going to do is, is add these, these sort of background elements to create a little like horizon line, use some landscapes in the distance to create sort of a distant mountain scene, which we're going to texture rather simply. You can see I also added a physical sky object, which allows us to get really great looking outdoor lighting. I'm going to adjust our camera angle a little bit here and just tweak some details and get our scene just the way we like it. You can see the, the shadows are pretty light here. I didn't want a super high contrast shadow. And I'm mixing in a little bit of blue into the green color that I used for the ground, and I'm going to apply that to the mountains. The reason I'm doing that is you've probably heard me talk about this on the show before, but atmospheric perspective really adds a lot of uh, depth to a piece. And basically, the basics of atmospheric, atmospheric perspective is that as objects get further away, they appear more blue, because in the visible light spectrum, the low wavelength stuff on the blue and indigo side of the spectrum actually travel much further than the stuff on the red side of the spectrum. So the warmer colors will actually drop out of our visual field uh, sooner. So that's why mountains always appear sort of bluish or purplish is because if they're really in the distance then the only light that's bouncing off of them that reaches our eyes is the blue wavelength stuff so knowing that you can make objects seem more far away by adding a little bit of blue to their color turning down the warmth a bit on them I'm adding a few additional details in the foreground here I felt that the the, the scene was a little bit too plain and actually, as, as I developed, I was going to leave it at just this simple grassy field animation. I decided to add a little critter to the foreground here. So I think we, we start modeling that guy pretty soon and do a really basic little animation of this uh, furry critter kind of poking his head up out of the grass. But you can see already that the, um, the motion on these blades of grass is really quick and easy to achieve, but um, quite, quite nice. Quite believable. Another thing you can do is if you add, this is sort of a little test. I wound up not using this in the final piece, but taking a bit of geometry here and adding a, um, a hair object collider to it, sorry, a hair collider object tag to it. And so the cool thing now is then if you, if you animate this cone or any other object with a collider attached to it across these, these blades of grass, it's actually going to affect them. You can see how they're sort of jiggling as this cone goes zipping by. There's another really fun, simple way to get some 
kind of natural, believable movement in uh, in whatever you're you're cloning across using these these hair objects. So we're adding a little brown gradient to this simple shape here, using a symmetry object to create some facial features. The cute little rabbity kind of guy. I probably could have done these little eye shapes with a sweep, but I decided to just use uh, soft selection. It worked in a pinch. Not, not perfect or ideal, maybe, but that's all right. One, one way to skin a cat. So now we've got our little critter in there, adding a bit of personality to the animation. And I decided since everything else in the scene around him was moving, that it wouldn't be a terrible idea to add a little bit of very simple motion to him as well. I thought it would be fun to make him sort of like a, like a nervous critter looking around for predators maybe. He's poking his head up and kind of concerned and looking around. And I actually have his facial features and ears kind of jump and perk up. So he does a quick le look left and a quick look right. His ears perk up and his facial features sort of jump. And then he loops back into position. Now thinking about it, I wish I'd, I'd kind of done this. Um, after the fact, but I could have had him animate a little bit uh, more dramatically, maybe had his head most of the way poked down and had his head poke further back up, so he was sort of hiding a little bit more, but oh well, hindsight's twenty twenty. So I'm pretty much ready, now. I'm just going to set up my rendering to uh, save in a certain folder, and uh, boom, there's, there's my output. going to... Actually, I, I lied. We're going to add just a few more details around this little, this little rodent creature. And then we're going to render our frames. So I'll spare you that part of the process. Skip through all that. Now we've got our frames in After Effects. And what happens is the... The grass stands straight up and down before it starts flopping over naturally. And I'm just going to cut the, that segment of frames out of the animation because ultimately we're going to be making a looping GIF here. So I adjust the timeline and, and crop a certain number of frames out. And I'm just sort of looping the video here to get, um, to get to a state where the looping of the grass is somewhat natural and, and feels okay. And so, done that, comfortable with how this thing loops. It's not a perfect seamless loop, but it's pretty close. It's much better than the, the drastic change that would have happened if we started from the, the true first frame, which had the grass standing like straight up and down. So we adjust that. We get that looking pretty good, pretty close. We add some post effects. And that brings us to our final little animated GIF here. Uh, if, if you like this video, if you found it useful, please uh, hit thumbs up and subscribe. If you have any uh, further questions, don't hesitate to ask one in the comments below. If you want to keep up with me and the work that I'm doing, hit me up on Instagram at DLGNCE. And I thank you very much for stopping by and hanging out with us this week, and we will see you next Tuesday. See ya!